series for beginners. In this lecture, we're going to be going over all the topics that you will learn in this course. So in the first section, we are going to cover Java language fundamentals. We're going to answer the questions, what is Java in the first place? Why do we use it? Where is it used? Why is it so important and in demand? Then in section two, we are going to start building classes. That means you're going to start building your first projects. We're going to be using real life, simple examples for beginners. You're going to understand all of the basics and key topics of object oriented programming. Then in section three, we're going to be working with methods. That means we're going to be adding more functionality to our Java applications. In section four, we're going to be covering operators. You're going to learn what is an operator, what are the different types, and we're going to be building plenty of examples with operators. And in section five, we're going to be deep diving into operators and looking at even more a big topic. That's why we have two sections for it. Then in section six, we're going to be talking about object interaction. We're going to be covering everything from how objects work together to how to build different types of applications. We're going to be building several sample examples such as games, bank accounts, tests, etc. Then in section seven, we're going to be learning about arrays. We're going to learn how to store data in Java. This is a very crucial topic for your applications in Java because you have to be able to store data. So we're going to cover arrays. Then in section eight, we're going to be looking at loops. One example is the for loop. We're going to be looking at for loops in depth and how we can use for loops to add more functionality and to do more with our Java applications. Then in section nine, we're going to be covering array lists. Array lists is another way to collect data. We're going to be talking about array lists and looking at more examples, as well as looking at the differences between array lists and arrays. Then in section 10, we're going to be looking at the iterator interface and use iterators to perform automated tasks in Java. So all of these 10 topics are the crucial fundamentals that every beginner in Java must know. If you're a complete beginner, we are starting out from scratch, assuming that you know no information. If you have experience, this will be a great review. We're going to be going through each topic concisely with real life examples and giving you not only the terms and the definitions and the concepts, but also code to back it up in each lecture. So we will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the questions, what is object oriented programming and what is Java to give you a thorough introduction to the two. So let's begin with what is object oriented programming. Well, object oriented programming is a paradigm based on the concept of objects. So you may have heard the term object oriented programming language, which means that that programming language is able to use the concept of objects. And these objects contain two things. One, they contain data and that is known as fields. And the second item that objects contain is code. This can also be known as procedures or functions. An example is you're building a game program with an object oriented programming language such as Java. So you're building a game in Java and because it's object oriented programming, this game would contain objects. For example, it could contain objects for each player. And in this way, each object's procedures will modify that object's data. So for example, each player object's procedures will modify that player's data. One example is you can change each player's name with that player's object. So rather than changing all of the players, you can change one individually through that object. And you can contain and create multiple player objects through one player class. So that is object oriented programming. Now, one example of an object oriented programming language, so one programming language that can follow the paradigm of objects is Java. So let's answer the question, what is Java? Well, first of all, it is an object oriented programming language. Next, Java is a programming language and computing platform that was released by Sun in 1995. It is general purpose, which means you can use it for a variety of programs, applications, etc. And it is class based, and as we already said, it's object oriented. So, class based means you can make classes from it, such as we mentioned, you can make one player class to make several player objects. So, this way, one class will handle the functionality that is common to all players, but each player will be unique. So all class, all players will have a name because there's a player class, but each of the players names will be different. 
Now, Java is designed to have as few implementation dependencies as possible, which means it will have few dependencies and each class will be as independent as possible, which makes the code easier to maintain, it makes it cleaner, it makes it easier to fix because if one class is broken, few classes will be affected because of that. In this way, one class breaks, you fix that class, and if you have few dependencies, it means other classes will be okay and you won't have to fix them in order to fix the whole program because each class is as independent as possible. So that is Java. Let's talk about why should you learn Java. Well, Java is in demand first and foremost. Many people are hiring and there are many applications and websites currently out that won't work unless you have Java installed and many more are being created daily with Java. Why? Because Java is fast, secure and reliable everywhere from laptops to data centers to security to the military to game consoles and supercomputers apps on your cell phone or cell phones themselves to the internet they implement Java so as you can see it is a versatile so if you learn Java once you'll be able to apply it in multiple areas now is Java free to download the answer is yes now for this course you don't need to download Java why because we're gonna be using a website called REPL.IT and this allows you to run Java instantly in the web browser so on your web page you can instantly run your Java programs with REPL and we are using REPL because it is so convenient you don't have to download or install Java but if you wish, you can download and install Java for free and use it on an integrated development environment, so a program such as Android Studio or Eclipse. So for that, you'll have to download Java from java.com and you'll have to download your IDE, so you'll have to download Android Studio or download Eclipse. Or you can follow along with us for these beginner series in REPL.IT, which is a website. Okay, let's go. Thank you for watching, everyone. You just answered the questions, what is object-oriented programming and what is Java? So let's go ahead and we'll see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be going over REPL.IT, which is a website where you can instantly install an integrated development environment. So that's what's known as an IDE. And this environment means you can test your code and run it and build projects. So you can also install an IDE such as Eclipse or Android Studio and then also install Java. However, if you prefer to test your examples in the browser, all you need is the internet, then you can use REPL.IT. So I have REPL.IT open right here. All you have to do is type in REPL.IT in the search bar, hit enter, and it will visit the website REPL.IT. Then you don't even need to sign up. You can just hit new REPL you can make a new REPL without even an account. Then you select your language. So we're learning Java, so we're going to hit Java. We're going to hit Create REPL, and a new REPL will automatically be created. So we're going to look at what these tabs are in REPL and how we can change settings and preferences, as well as what REPL does. So first we have our name, which is anonymous because we're a guest, and a random string for this random new REPL. Up here you can invite collaborators, you can hit run to run the project, you can zoom in like this, just hitting command plus or control plus. You can hit run to run your code, and then you can share the project, make another REPL, talk to people, or make an account. Okay, that is the header covered. Then you have three main tabs here, main windows. So on the left, let's begin with that. On the left you have a files tab. So you can dr click and drag this to open it and see it on a wider scale. So this will list all the files in your project. You can add a new file by hitting that new file button and make a new file such as player.java. And just like that, you'll have a new file. You can also make a new folder, folder, and put files into your folders. Okay, uh, you can click on these three dots here to upload a file from your computer, upload a folder from your computer, or download the whole project from REPL as a zip to your computer. So that is extremely useful because you can build in the browser and then download it and save it. Okay, that is that window, the file navigator covered. Let's talk about this window here. So this is what's known as our code. So this will hold each file in our project. So right now it's showing the default class that is created for us. 
main.java is the file name and the class is named main. And REPL will instantly create a new main method for you with every REPL. And the main method is the door to your application. So it will run whenever you hit run because it enters the application. So when you hit run, REPL will read your code and then print or anything that you want to print or just perform every task that you coded into the console. So that's what is right here on the right hand side, this right hand window. This is known as the console and it will print and perform and execute your code for you. Okay, what we have up here, let's zoom in. What we have up here is a description of what is going on. So REPL is opening a new runtime environment to run the code. Then it is looking for the class path and it is telling you that it is run. it has this class player.java inside a folder named folder as well as a main.java file. Then the next line is the class path of the actual class that REPL is running. And in this case, it will always run by default the main class. Hello world is the default line we have in the default class. You can run a different class by copying this text and typing the name of your class just like that. You may get an error right now, but that's totally fine. We're not actually writing code yet. We're just looking at the REPL. Okay, next what we have here is the toolbar on the side. So you can click on the first icon to toggle open or close that files navigator. Then you have version control where you can track versions of your project. Then you have settings. So let's go ahead and expand the settings. Settings is where you can set the preferences for your development environment. So we have the layout. Right now the layout is side by side, which means the code is side by side with the console, but you can change it to stacked with that drop down. So now the code is on top and the, con the console is on the bottom. Some people may prefer that. You can also change the theme from light to dark. Typically dark is easier on the eyes if you have trouble staring at a computer for too long. Then you have the font size which you can change from tiny, normal, large to huge. We're going to be using mostly huge throughout this course for you mobile users. Then you can change the indent type which refers to these, this indent for your code. You can change from spaces to tabs. Spaces is more common nowadays which is why we have spaces as the default. You can change the indent size as well from 2 to 4 to 8 and that will change as you build your class. Then you can change the keybinds as well but we won't be looking at indent size or keybinds in this course. Wrapping refers to how your code is clipped or not clipped so the default is soft wrap which means as the window gets smaller you can still see the code it wraps it doesn't clip but if you change wrapping to none you'll see the code will clip and it will not jump to the next line to show it to you if the window is tiny. Code intelligence is very useful it allows you to see helpful hints and auto completes so instead of having to type out a lot of code sometimes you can auto complete some of it like you can auto complete a variable name for example instead of typing the whole variable Okay, so by default, code intelligence is enabled. You can disable it sometimes, but it's useful to have code intelligence enabled because it will give you hints. And REPL is extremely helpful because it will highlight keywords in blue. It will highlight different data types with different colors. So REPL is overall great to use. It's free. It runs in a browser. You don't need to install anything. Again, you can install an IDE and use something like Eclipse or Android Studio for this course, or you can follow along in the browser conveniently. Okay, that is everything we're going to be covering in this tutorial. You just learned how to use REPL and run Java right in the browser, right on the web. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be introducing section one and going over every topic that we're going to be covering in this section, Java language fundamentals. So the first thing we're going to be covering are classes. What are Java classes? How do we make a Java class? This is a key topic because every program that you build with Java will consist of classes. So it is a requirement for the Java programs you make. Next, we are going to be covering the topic of objects. Objects are related to classes because you make objects using classes. So these two topics are definitely interwoven and both form the basis of every Java program. 
So we are starting with them. Next, we'll be building variables using different data types. So we're going to be learning how to store data with Java to be used throughout every Java program you make, regardless of what kind. So we're going to be looking at the most common data types used. And these are primitives and object types. So we're going to be looking at integers, doubles, booleans, and characters as the most common primitive data types, as well as we're going to learn how to build variables of object types. So one example is the string variable. That is an object type. And we're going to be learning how to build variables to store data of all these different types. Next, we're going to learn about object state. We're going to define what is object state and how do we make objects and see their state. And finally, we are going to be covering methods. So methods are those procedures we mentioned earlier. And methods are crucial for Java because they perform all the tasks of your Java program. So without methods, your program wouldn't be able to perform any tasks. So that's why we are covering that in fundamentals. Well, those are all of the topics we'll be covering in section one. So let's go ahead and get started. We will see you in the first tutorial. Hello everyone and welcome to our Java tutorial for beginners. In this lesson, we're going to be answering the question, what is a class in Java? Well, a class, as you can see, I have on the screen is a file. This whole entire thing here, the whole page is a class. It's the equivalent of a file. And what does the file do? Well, the file describes a general category. So here on the page, I have a class named main and everything inside of the class will describe a general category. Here in REPL, I can run classes by running files by clicking the big green run button up top. And the compiler here on the right side will run the class. And as you can see, it will print hello world just as the class here is describing the compiler will do what the class tells it to. Now, this class will contain two types of things. It will contain number one, attributes, which is another word for data. And also it will contain behaviors, such as a method. A behavior is a task to perform. So let's look at another example. Another example of a class could be a bank account class. So to create one, I would use the keyword class and use the naming convention of title case to write class bank account. And I would open the curly brackets and close the curly brackets to contain the class body. So now on screen, we have two classes. We have a main class and we have a bank account class. Typically, you will have one class per file, but for our example, we can have several. So what does this bank account class do? Well, right now it does nothing, but we can put attributes and behaviors inside of this class to describe every bank account we want to create from then on out. So we can take this method from the main class instead and put it into the bank account class and change this print line method, which prints a line right here to the, to the console. We can change it to say, I am a bank account. And now this class has its very first behavior. It now does something. So if we hit run, we will see that printed here as soon as the compiler finishes compiling. So. Let's wait for it to finish compiling. Aha, let's see what error we have here. Error main method not found. That means the compiler did not find the main method. And that goes back to the problem of having multiple classes per file. For clean code convention, keep one class per file. We can fix this error by changing the class make account to, to class main and doing it like this so that we have one class per file. And 
let me help you understand the compiler here a bit more. As you can see, it's also looking for the main class in main.java, which is why we have to have class main up here. We can change this name by typing out this entire line and replacing the class name with a different class name to run a different class. But the very default it will run is a main class here in REPL. And there we have it. We printed a new line IMA bank account, which we added in here. And that was performed in the main class, in the main.java file. Great job, everyone. Now, one last thing to note about classes is currently our main class has a behavior, but remember it can also have attributes. So if we change it again to bank account, the, the attributes it would have refers to the data contained about the class and it will be specific to the class. So a bank account class may have attributes such as the account holder, this is one piece of data, or another piece of data such as the year opened, or another piece of data such as the balance in USD in the account. These here are all attributes which are stored in classes and the attributes describe the class and we'll be going in detail about how to make attributes ourselves later in this course. Thank you for watching. In summary, you answered the question what is a class and learned that a class contains attributes as well as behaviors. And every time you run a file, we are running a class. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next video. Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture in our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question what is an object. Now in the previous lecture we learned what is a class and classes and objects are very closely related. So whereas a class describes a general category and as we learned it contains attributes and behaviors, an object is one instance of this class. So every time I create an object I create a new instance of a class and I can create as many objects as I would need from one class or I can create zero objects from the class. Let's look at an example. If I have a class called bank account, then as soon as I describe all of the attributes and behaviors I need for my bank accounts, such as the account holder or the balance, as soon as I've defined all the attributes as well as behaviors, then I can create objects from the class. And the general entity is the class because there are no specific values for the data. But when you create the object from the class, that is when you set the specific data. Thank you for watching everyone. And in the next lecture, we're going to be learning about instance variables. We'll see you there. Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture in our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be answering the question what are data types in Java? We're going to be looking at two categories of Java data types and there are only two. Let's start with our first example this one you may commonly recognize if you have ever studied math. We're going to create a data type of an integer and for that we're going to need a variable. So let's go ahead and make a variable right in here in the main method which runs our application. So far we have it printing out hello world as, the, as is the default by REPL. Let's create our first variable, which will be an int. And to declare the variable, we will now need a name, so int x. And just like that, we have made our first integer variable. An integer is of the primitive category 
of the data types in Java. And primitive means it is part of the java.lang package. So you don't have to import it from an external package. It comes with Java whenever you use the language. And what types of data can we store in an integer? We can store whole numbers only. So let's assign these integer variables some integer values. And to do so, we call the variable by its name. We use the get operator and we give it a value such as 9. Now, we can print the value of this variable to the console to test if this assignment has been done properly. Let's let the compiler enter our main application and as you can see the compiler printed hello world and it printed 9 which means we have correctly given x the value of 9. Now we must always declare a data type when we declare a variable and the data type that we declare must match the data type of the value which means we could not give x a value such as 9 in quotation marks because that is a different syntax, it's the wrong syntax for integers. Whenever you declare an integer, you must simply write the number. And as you can see, the compiler will give an error for making this mistake. So we're going to comment that out for being wrong. An integer also means it can be negative, so we can do x equals negative 9. And by writing x equals 9 and then x equals negative 9, we have changed the value of x. It will no longer be 9, it will now be negative 9. Let's test this, and as you can see, the compiler will print negative 9. Let's go ahead and try to give it another improper value, such as something with a decimal point. So if we, if we try to do negative 9.9, .9, we would get another error because an integer means a whole number, negative, positive, or zero. As you can see, the compiler will give you an error. Possible lossy conversion from double to int, which means there is a conversion error. You're trying to assign the wrong type to an integer variable. And don't worry, we'll learn what a double is next. Now, you may be asking yourself, what would happen if we didn't give x any value? Could we still use x even if we haven't initialized it, which means assigned it a value? Well, let's go ahead and test and see what happens. Variable x might not have been initialized. Well, it is telling us that x has not been initialized, but x will have a default value and that value is set by Java and it is zero. Great job for watching everyone. In the next lecture, we're going to be discussing the next data type, which will be in the same category of primitive data types. In this lecture, you learned about the first, which is an integer. Thank you for watching and we will see you there. Hello everyone and welcome to our Java tutorial series for beginners. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question, what is the double data type in Java? In the last lecture, we looked at integers, and in this one, we're going to be looking at doubles. So let's go ahead and make our first double integer or double data type. Now, we're going to be doing this above the main method this time so that we can see the default value initially. Let's go ahead and make the double variable x. And just like that, we have declared our first double variable. Now, let's see what happens when we print this variable to the console to check its default value. Every variable with the data type will have a default value. Now, the error we're seeing up here is non-static variable x cannot be referenced from a static context. And that is due to the static keyword, which is required for the main method. And to fix this error, you have to write the word static before the double variable declaration. Static means that 
these attributes and behaviors that are static can only access other static attributes and behaviors. And that is because they are accessible from everywhere. It means any class can change them and therefore they must be static. We'll be exploring these keywords later on in this course. But for now, all you need to know is that to test a variable in the static main method, we must declare it as static. Okay, now that we have changed that, let's see what the value will be in the console. As you can see, the compiler first printed the first line, hello world, that was there by default whenever we made a new REPL project. And then it printed the second line, the second print line, which printed the value of x. And as you can see, the default value of x was 0.0, .0 because we didn't assign it any value. This 0.0, .0 is the default given to every double variable double is the second type of data in the primitive category and it refers to as you may guess from the default decimal numbers which means that we can put decimal places into a double variable as opposed to the previous example where we could only use whole numbers let's look at another example of what we can put into x we can change the value from 0, 0.0 to something like 9.9. .9. Now let's see what happens when we run the project, which will instantly jump to the main method. And now you can see it will print 9.9, .9, which means we successfully changed the value from the default 0, 0.0 to 9.9. .9. We can also change it again to a negative, something like negative 0.009. And let's see what happens when we run it now. As you can see, it will now print the new value, negative 0.09. 9.9 is erased from memory, and instead, the value is changed to negative 0.009. You may be wondering what would happen if we gave this double variable just a whole number value. What would happen if we didn't put a decimal place? Well, as you can see, Java will instantly add the decimal place for you and make it 9.0. Important to note, it's simply declared without any quotations around it. The value will be given straight as the number. Okay, great job everyone. You've now learned about the second type of data in the primitive data category. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question, what is the Boolean data type in Java. So let's go ahead and create our first Boolean variable, a variable of type Boolean. And to do that, we use the keyword of the name of the data type, which is Boolean, reserved in Java for Boolean variables. And let's give it a name such as open. And just like that, we have declared our first Boolean variable. And remember, we want to test this in the main method, so we're going to declare it as static. Now, let's print it and test the default value given to Boolean variables in Java. So hit run, and the compiler will print this line with the value of the variable we named. As you can see, we have our first default hello world line, and then we have the word false being printed. What does this mean? Well, this means that the default value for a Boolean variable is false. Now, important to know about Boolean variables is they can only contain one of two values, either false, which is the default, or true. 
This is different from the other two types of variables we looked at earlier, which are integers and doubles. Those can have many different values because they can be 1, 2, 3, 3.3, 3, up to a limit, but Booleans can only have true or false. Let's look at what would happen if we change the value of our open variable to true, and then we printed out the value of open. Let's see what the compiler will spit out for that value. Well, there you have it. We have the default hello world, which is this line up here, and then we have open being printed as false, its value, and then we changed the value of open by initializing it and giving it the value of true. And so the compiler then printed the value again, but this time instead of false, it was true. Let's look at what would happen if we change the value to something else such as three or four and we hit run. What would happen if we tried to give this integer to the boolean? Well, as you can see, the compiler will spit out an error in the console that says incompatible types. Int integer cannot be converted to a boolean. So the compiler recognized that we assigned an integer and we tried to shove it into a boolean. And it spat out an error because of that. So that means this is wrong. Because remember, a boolean can only have true or false as its value. Another important thing to note about booleans is that you must assign the value as either true or false precisely like this. If you try to do something like open equals false in quotation marks, you would get an error. And don't take my word for it. Take the compiler's word for it when it spits you this error string cannot be converted to boolean. That's because by having these quotations you instantly change the data type of the value you're attempting to assign to the variable. And we're going to be learning about strings shortly, don't you worry. But again, this would also be wrong. The only possible values for boolean are true or false with no quotations. Great job, everyone. You have now answered the question, what is a boolean variable? Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next lecture where we will continue with data types of the same category, primitive data types. Hello everyone, welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question, what is the char data type in Java? Let's go ahead and declare our first char variable by using the keyword char, which is shortened form of character. That's what it stands for is character. So let's make a character such as a first letter. And just like that, we have declared our first char variable in Java. Char is another one of those primitive variable data types, which means it comes with the java.lang package. And let's look at what will be the default value for a char variable before we initialize it to any value ourselves, what will be the default? Let's take a look and let the compiler tell us in the console. Well, as you can see, we'll get the error that we didn't declare the variable as static because typically we would not declare variables as static usually, but because we are testing this variable in a static method, the static method can only use static attributes. So as you can see, just a blank line was printed under hello world, but first letter did not have any value. And that's because the default value set by Java for a char variable is what is known as the null character. We'll be discussing null later on in this course. All you need to know for now is that null means undefined. So there was a blank line 
but it means undefined and that is different from zero or a blank space it means that it has no value it's been uninitialized so far so let's go ahead and initialize our first letter variable so that instead of being null poor thing has a value so to initialize it we call its name and use the get operator which is a single equal sign and we do a very interesting thing which we haven't seen yet it's these single quotations now the single quotations are reserved for character data types which means that we can only use single quotation marks when we're assigning the value of a character so let's go ahead and print out cut that print out line from the top because we'll just get a blank line and put it underneath the initialization so now the compiler will jump into the main method we will print hello world first then it will assign the value of first letter to a and then it will print the value of the first letter and as you can see right there is proof in the pudding in the console we have hello world and then we have a let's try to change the value of first letter to something else let's look at what else can we give to this char variable well a char is any one alphanumeric character or symbol that means if we try to do something like a b c even as you can see instantly repl will change the color to white because this is no longer a char value as you can see, the compiler will be full of errors, unclosed character literal. That means that we started a character, A is a character, but then we didn't close the character right away as we should have. We continued with B, C. And that's what spat out the error. So that means that this would be wrong because a char variable must only contain one or zero alphanumeric characters or symbols so let's try to give it a valid value instead let's look at what would happen if we gave first letter the value of five in single quotations take a guess do you think this would work or would it spit out errors all over again well let's test it and find out well we don't have anything but that's because we didn't print it a second time so right now we have to add another print line the print line method will print the value for us but it will only do it once if we want to print the value again after we initialized it a second time then we must call print line again so as you can see it worked we don't have any red errors we have hello world we have a the first value we printed and then we changed the value from a to 5 and we didn't get any errors even though 5 is an integer and why is that that's because we changed the integer into a character when we enclosed it in these single quotes if we try to do something like first letter equals 5 without the single quotes well let's look at what the compiler will tell us if we try to do that well, again, we didn't try to print it. Let's try to print it again underneath. It does print A and it does print 5, but this would be wrong because this, without single quotes, is now a an integer. It's no longer a char, and that's why nothing will be printed here. That means that this is wrong. Okay, let's take a look at what would happen if we tried to declare first letter in double quotes. And let's give it this time a different letter, such as E. And let's print out the value this time, system.out.println with the name of the variable and hit run. And let's see if it will work with double quotes. Aha we got an error string cannot be converted to char the error is incompatible types that's because 
The double quotes are reserved for a different type of variable, which we will look at shortly. Now, remember the definition to take away from this lecture is that a chart is a single or zero alphanumeric character or symbol, which means we can give it some more, some different values. First, we will note that this is wrong, and then we can write down some more important variable variable values we can try. It can be a single or zero, which means that a space would be valid as well. We can test this by printing first letter again to the console, and this will be valid. Even though it's not a letter or a number, it still is valid because it has single quotes around something we pressed on the keyboard and so we'll get a space here. If you're wondering why 5 has come up three times, that's because we printed it three times here. But there, now we're only printing it once after each time we change its value. Now, we can also give first letter a symbol. As long as it's in the single quotes, it will work. So a symbol such as the AND symbol, that will also be valid because it's on the keyboard. Let's go ahead and test that by running it and see what the compiler will spit out. Will it accept this and, and symbol? And yes it will, there you have it. It's printing the new value. Good job everyone. You have learned about chars in Java. You learned that the default value is the null character and you learned that a char is any one or zero alphanumeric character or symbol. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be answering the question what is a string in Java? Let's go ahead and declare our first string up here in the class. We declare a string by using the keyword string and you can notice off the bat there is something different that I have done with this variable declaration other than the previous data types we looked at and that is I capitalized the name of the data type and REPL itself has kept it as the color white instead of changing it to the blue like we had with an integer x it changed the data type to blue whereas here the string data type is white why is that well that is because a string is an object data type and we have hit our first type of the second category which is the object data type it's also known as the reference type because this data type is part of a class which means every time we use an object data type we're no longer using the default data types that come with Java string is the only exception for every other reference or object variable we will have to do something other than simply use it and we're going to be looking at many examples later on. Let's go ahead and look at what the default value will be for this string variable. We're going to go ahead and call a print line method to print the value of this string variable in the console here. Again, we get this static error because the main, me the main method, which is static, requires that any values used directly must be static as well. And look what we have here. In the console we have hello world and we have the second line which is here. We have null printed. And what is null? We saw null earlier when we talked about chars. Well, if you remember, null means undefined because we did not initialize the variable account holder which means it has no value, nor does it have a default value given to it by Java except for null, which itself means undefined. So let's go ahead and change the value of account holder from null 
undefined to something. And we do that the same way we did for the primitive data types by using the get operator and giving a value. And note already, this is where I'm using the double quotes to assign the value to the string variable. Double quotes are reserved for strings. As you can see, the first print line, hello world, is in double quotes, and that's because this hello world is a string as well. Now, again, it printed null because we printed the line before we changed the value. So to fix or change that, all we have to do is call print line after we initialize the variable and hit run again. Now, there we have it. We have our three strings, hello world, null, and a name. So what is a string? Let's give a clear definition. It is any sequence of alphanumeric characters or symbols, and it must be enclosed in double quotations when given a value. The name itself is not in double quotations, but the value will be in double quotations. A string is very similar to a char, but whereas a char can only hold one alphanumeric character or symbol, a string can now hold multiple without getting errors. Let's take a look at some more potential values that we can give to account holder instead of the default null and a name. We can also do something like this and then print it again to see the changed value after the value has been reassigned. As you can see, one is an integer, but by putting double quotes around the one, it is no longer an integer. It will now be treated as a string, which means instead of being able to add one plus one to get two, when you add one plus one, you'll actually get 11. We'll look at that later on. Let's try another value for account holder, such as just empty double quotation marks. Let's take a look at if this will give us an error or if it will print something. Go ahead and take a guess as we wait for the compiler to print the values in the console. Well, there you have it. It printed a blank line. That's because, yes, you can have zero or more alphanumeric characters or symbols in a string. So this is different from the default value null because when we have these double quotation marks with nothing inside, we didn't get null again, we got a blank line. That's because even though this has nothing in it, it's still defined, whereas null is undefined. Let's try one more value for account holder. What if we tried true? If you recall earlier in this course, we made a variable with the data type of boolean, and we had that value as true as well. But you'll remember that booleans must be declared and initialized with without the double quotation marks. So yes, this true in quote double quotation marks, it instantly becomes a string and it will not be treated as a boolean. Great job, everyone. You just learned what a string is in Java, one of the most commonly used data types. Strings will be used everywhere. Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next tutorial. Hello everyone, and welcome to another tutorial in our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question, what is object state in Java? Let's go ahead and change the name of this class to make a more concrete example, such as a bank account. So now we have a bank account class, and let's give it at least one attribute, such as the account holder. And in order to make bank accounts from the bank account class, we're going to need a constructor. The constructor creates bank account
account objects. And every time we make a bank account object, we will have to set the account holder name. And we can do that by accepting input for the account holder. So we use account holder input. Then we can set the value of this object's account holder to equal the account holder input. And in this way, we'll be able to use the constructor to make objects each with a unique account holder for the name. Let's go ahead and run this example by making a bank account object. So to do that, we call the bank account class and we give the object a name. And just like that, we have a bank account variable. And now to make this variable into an object of type bank account, we initialize it in the same way we initialize any variable using the get operator and the keyword new with the bank account constructor. This constructor call must match the constructor up here. In order to do that, we must pass a parameter that matches the data type of this parameter, string. So we can go ahead and do that by making a string variable inside the uh, constructor call. And just like this, we will make a new object with a unique account holder name. Let's go ahead and run this to verify that it works. Now, the set of values for an object's fields are what make up the object state which means that the object state of this object are its fields. In this case, it only has one field, this name. And every time you make a new object with different fields, different values for its data, you make a new object state, which means I can make a new bank account object called bank account two. And then I could assign a bank account to, to a new bank account object using the constructor call. And I can pass in a different object state, such as a new name, to make a new bank account for a new person. And there we have two different bank account objects, each with their own object state. And we're not getting any errors in the console, which means we successfully created two bank account objects properly. Great job, everyone. You have now answered the question, what is object state in Java? Thank you for watching, and we will see you in the next lecture. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question, what are methods in Java? Well, in addition to attributes, we learned that classes contain behaviors, and behaviors are methods. So whenever you make a, a new project in REPL, you will get this code, which has a main class as well as a main method. That's right, this here is a method itself. And methods perform a task or function. And typically it's best to keep methods small, performing small tasks such as printing a line. But methods can become much larger than simply one line. Let's look at an example such as for a game. Suppose we're making a game class and we wanted to make game objects. Well, what kinds of behaviors might we want our game to do? We might want our game to calculate a score. Well, just like that, we have made our first method. Methods are created, declared, and initialized using this syntax. First, you have the visibility modifier of the method, which means how can the method be accessed? Typically, they are public, which means they can be accessed from any class. The second part of a method declaration is the return type. What will the method return? 
which means what will it output? Void means it will output nothing. Then you have the method name. In this case, calculate score. And notice this camel casing. Camel casing is similar to title casing, where you capitalize the first letter of each word, except the first letter of the entire name must be lowercase. That is known as camel casing. Then you have parentheses, which take in arguments, which mean we can put extra data in here to use in the method, but we don't need parameters. Some methods may need parameters to perform their task and some may not. As you can see, the main method has these default arguments or parameters that you must always include, but this one might not necessarily have parameters. All right, good job everyone. You have now learned about methods in Java. Stay tuned for the next tutorial and we will see you there. Hello everyone and congratulations, you just completed section one of this Java crash course. You just learned Java language fundamentals and in this lecture we're going to be summarizing what we just learned in section one. So first you learned what is a Java class as well as what are Java objects and you learned that these two work together in every Java program. Next you learned about the most common data types in Java. There are two types of data types, the primitive data type and the object data type. And you looked at four examples of the primitive data type, integers, doubles, booleans, and characters. And you learned how to build variables of different data types of those primitives, as well as of the first object data type. We've seen the string. After making variables, you also learned about what is object state in Java. And finally, you learned what are methods and how do we build and use methods. You learned that methods are used in every Java program to complete functionality and procedures and make a program work. Well, that is everything you learned in section one. Congratulations, everyone. And we will see you in section two, where we are going to be building classes. See you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this section, we are going to be learning about how to build classes in Java. And in this lecture, we're going to be introducing every topic in section two. Let's go ahead and look at all the topics. Number one, we're going to be talking about visibility modifiers. So what are they and why are they important in Java? Next, we're going to talk about constructors, which allow you to build objects from classes. We're going to be looking at how we can make constructors as well as the default constructor. So we're going to be talking about the role of the constructor. What is its purpose? It has multiple purposes actually and its functionality. Next we're going to be looking at parameters and arguments. We're going to be defining those and looking at how we can use them in Java. Number five we are going to be answering the common constructor questions and mistakes. We're going to be looking at common hiccups that beginners can get into when making constructors. And by being aware of these common mistakes, you will avoid them in the future. Next, we are going to be talking about assignment operators. So what are they? As well as assignment statements. These two work together and we're going to be looking at how we can use them and build with them in Java. Next, we are going to be talking about multiple variables and values. And we are going to be answering the question, what is null? Null is a very important concept in Java because it is used frequently and can often be the cause of errors and bugs in your program. So null is an important topic that we'll be covering. Number 10, we are going to be answering the question, what is the relational operator in Java? And actually there are several. So we're going to be defining it as a whole and looking at the several kinds of relational operators. These are extremely useful in Java because they help you perform tasks based on certain conditions. And related to relational operators, we're going to be looking at conditional statements. So what are conditional statements in Java? We're going to be answering that question as a whole, as well as looking at specific conditional statements, which are the if statement, the else statement, and the else if statement. And all three of these work together or work individually to perform tasks 
or keep tasks unperformed in Java. Next, we are going to be answering the question, what is assignment and what is equality? Because these two are very easy to get confused. Assigning a value versus checking the equality of a value. If you get these two confused, it is very easy to encounter errors and bugs. So in the lecture on assignment versus equality, we're going to be clearly defining the difference between assignment and equality. Then we are going to be looking at how to throw exceptions in Java. We're going to be looking at just one type of exception because there are many types of exceptions. And we're going to be looking at the most common and useful exception to throw. Exceptions are extremely useful for debugging and going through your code, watching out for errors, and becoming informed when something in your program is working not as you expected. So exceptions are an extremely important topic. Then we are going to be looking at types of comments, finally, our final topic in this section. There are three types of comments that you can create in Java, and comments are very useful to you as a developer for keeping code clean, keeping code maintainable, and helping you and your whole team understand what your code is. You may know what your code is today, but if you look at it tomorrow, you may have forgotten completely what you were writing the day before. So those are all the topics we are going to be covering in section two. Let's get started and we will see you in the first lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're gonna be answering the question, what are visibility modifiers in Java? Well, visibility modifiers Another term you may have heard them called are access modifiers. And that refers to how we can access various elements such as attributes, behaviors, and even classes themselves have visibility modifiers. So let's talk about two of them first. Classes will typically be declared as public. Why? Because we want to access classes from outside of themselves. Public means that we can access the element from outside of the current class. That's why a main method always must be declared as public because it will always be the first point of entry to the application and therefore it must be public so that the application can be entered. And classes will also always be public because we want to access classes from outside themselves. A Java project will consist of many classes and therefore you must use classes from other classes. And we couldn't do that if every class was public. When we make something public, we block it off from being able to be accessed from outside the class. You may be wondering, why would we want to do that? Why would we want to declare something as private? Well, we do this to keep it safe. Let's see. Again, we're getting this message that the value of the variable we declared is not being used. That's totally fine. It just means that we declared the variable and we didn't initialize it with a value yet. Variables, specifically instance variables, will always be private. And that's because you will remember that instance variables are attributes of classes, which means they hold data. And we don't want this data to be manipulated out of nowhere. We want to be very specific about how this data can be set. And the only way to be specific and put limits on how this data can be accessed and changed and modified is by making the variable itself, which will hold a reference to the memory where this data is stored. The only way to keep that reference safe is to make it private. Now, what else might we make public? Because instance variables are what we will always make private. Well, what we will make public are constructors. So let's use a more practical example than something general like main, let's use an online store example. Suppose we were making an online store class from which we would want to make online store objects. Well, we would have a constructor with the same name as the class name. 
and constructors will always be declared with the public keyword. And why is that? Well, it's because constructors construct objects and therefore the object must be constructed from outside the class itself. Because suppose we wanted to create an online store object down here, online store, online store object equals, well, just like that, we have an online store variable, online store object variable. And now we need to turn it into an object by initializing it to the value of new online store. And we couldn't do this without making this constructor public. Let's go ahead and test this. You'll see when it's public, the compiler will run just fine. Let's see what it's telling us. Class online store is public, should be declared in a file named online store.java. Okay, that's because we have a main.java file, but we can, that's because we need to change the class to public, but we can remove that for this testing purpose. Let's see what it gives us in this case. Okay, it's telling us that it could not find or load main class main. Let's analyze this error message. This error message is due to the fact that the default by REPL to run will be the main class, but remember we changed the name of the class for our example. So if we want to run this class with a new name, we must copy this, which is Java class path. So this is the path to the class we want to run. The path is in this folder, in this subfolder, and then the name of the class is online store, and then we can hit enter, and now it will run without the exit status error. Okay, that's just because we changed the class name to online store. So as you can see, this is running properly. We were successfully able to make an online store object using the new online store convention to create a new object. But what would we what would happen if we were to make the constructor private? Well, let's run and test. What would happen if we tried to use a private constructor from outside of the class? Well, oh, again we're getting the main could not load class main. To simplify this, we can change the name of the class to main so that we don't have to to specify which class we want to run, we will just go with the default. And there you go, we have an error invalid method declaration return type required. That's because Java is no longer recognizing this as a constructor because the syntax for constructor must always be public. So when you change it to private, it's no longer even going to be recognized as a constructor and therefore you'll no longer be able to make objects. Okay, so we've talked about how classes will always be public, instance variables will always be private, and constructors will always be public due to the logic of what they are used for. You know, a class is used with other classes a constructor is used outside of the class to make the object itself, whereas the instance variable is used inside of the class to hold valuable data. What is another thing we could declare as public or private? Well, we haven't talked about methods yet. Methods. Ask a question. Would methods be public or would they be private? private void calculate. Here we've declared two methods. We have calculate and calculate, two methods with the same name and it's even telling us a duplicate method calculates. So we can do calculate two to remove that. And would we want a method to be public or private? Well, let's think about the use of a method. The use of a method is to perform a task. And the task can be performed only inside the class, or sometimes we will want to call methods. For example, if we wanted to calculate the total revenue of the online store, then we could call calculate to use it outside of the class. 
because the main method can be called from anywhere. It doesn't have to be inside of a class. So the answer is that methods can be public or private depending on what we're using them for. So some methods we can make public and some methods we can make private. We will look at this more later on in this course. So great job everyone. You have now learned about visibility modifiers in Java. You learned that classes and constructors will always be public. Instance variables will always be private. And methods can be either or. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next tutorial. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be answering the question what is a constructor in Java? Well we've already used and seen some constructors in this course but let's get crystal clear on what they are. A constructor is a special method. That's right, a constructor is a method. So whenever we make a constructor, we use the public keyword and then we use the name of the class. We open parentheses for any potential arguments we might want to take. Then we open curly brackets for the constructor body. And this is very similar to declaring and initializing a method. For example, a method public avoid calculate. As you can see, these two look very similar because they both have an accessibility and access modifier. Public, they, now this method could also be private instead of public, whereas the constructor must be public. But you'll also notice that the constructor name matches the class name exactly, whereas other methods We'll begin with a lowercase letter as per Java convention. Even though they look slightly different, they are both methods. You can also tell this because they both have parentheses which accept parameters and they both have curly brackets for a body. And as we mentioned, the constructor name will be the exact same name as the class name. What would happen? if we did not provide a constructor. How would we make objects? For example, if we wanted to make a main object by using the same syntax as previously, main main object creates a variable and then the new keyword followed by the constructor call creates the object itself. Would this work even though we didn't make a constructor anywhere to be found. Can we still make an object without creating a constructor? The answer is yes. And why? That's because if we make no constructor, Java will create one behind the scenes. It won't show you, but it will create one. And we can test that this is true by printing out the value of the object we created. We declared a variable named main object and then we use the new keyword to make the object. New will always make an object. So what will happen if we print out the value of main object? Well look you can see in the console we have main at 5ACF9800. You may be wondering what is this? Well whenever you print the value of an object just like this the default that Java will do is print the name of the object's class where it comes from and that is specified here which is main and then it will print the memory address. This will be different each time and it refers to the location in memory where this object is being stored. And the only reason we were able to make an object and then prove its existence is because Java made a default constructor to construct the object. This default constructor looks like this. This was created behind the scenes. It's an, it takes no parameters, which you can see here, no parameters. And it also has no body. Important thing to note about constructors that we saw is that they will never have 
a return type unlike every other method which must have some return type which for the main method is always void the constructor will not have a return type it's part of what makes it special great job everyone you now have defined a constructor and learned about this default one that's created behind the scenes invisibly by Java if and only if you don't make one. As soon as you make a constructor yourself, Java will not make a second one for you behind the scenes. Great job everyone, thank you for watching and we will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be answering the question, what is the role of the constructor in Java? Well, we've looked at constructors before and let's go ahead and make one for this class. And remember, because the class is named main, the constructor must also be named main. A constructor should not be declared as private. The job of this constructor will be to ensure that any instance variables in the class are set to their proper values. So let's make this example more clear by creating a bank account class and making a bank account constructor. And now we can think about what kind of instance variables we might want for the bank account. Let's start with just one, such as the integer of a year opened, the year the bank account was opened. And remember, every instance variable must be declared as private. Now that we have an instance variable, we can set its value in the constructor. So we make an argument for the constructor year opened input. And this way, every time we make a bank account object, we can pass a value as a year to initialize the field year opened. And to do that, we will set this dot year opened equals year opened input. And we can now make an object and input a year. So let's go ahead and do that in the main method. Let's go ahead and make a new bank account object variable first called bank account object and then we can actually construct the object by calling new and calling the constructor. Now let's look at what would happen if we just ran this where we had the bank account object initialized to a new bank account with these empty parameters. Well you can see we'll get an error it says constructor bank account cannot be applied because there is required to be an int but there were found no arguments and the reason for the error that the compiler gives us is that the actual and formal arguments differ in length which means that because our constructor has an integer in the parameters whenever we call the constructor to create an object we must have the exact same number and type of parameters, which means if we put 2030 as the year the bank account was opened and then run it, this will fix the error because now the number of parameters matches. And we have no errors in the, in the console, so we know we did this well because our error disappeared. Now, you have learned that the constructor will create an object and it will ensure that the field of the object will have a proper input. That means that we can set to make sure that no other invalid value can be passed to the field. So we can ensure, for example, that the year opened input must be above zero. If year opened input is greater than zero, only then can we set the year opened. And we're going to be learning about more about setting restrictions on variables later, but this is a quick example. You can see we're setting the restriction that the year opened input which we will accept as the 
parameter, it must be above zero to be set to the variable, which means this 2030 cannot be a negative 2030. And in this way, a constructor allows us to set the proper values for the, the instance variables of the object. Great job, everyone. You have learned the role of the constructor in Java, which, to summarize, is to set proper values for instance variables. This is not the exact way that you will do it. We'll be looking at that in the later lectures, so we will see you there. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be answering the question, what are parameters in Java? Well, let's use a different example than main for this one. Suppose we were making a game and we wanted a player class so that we could create different player objects. Well, we might also want to have a player constructor to create objects. And inside of the constructor, we can choose whether or not we want to define parameters that the constructor will take in. For example, we could have a string to take in the player name, or we could have an integer to score the player's score, to keep track of that score. These two items in the parentheses are two parameters of the constructor. A parameter is a variable that is used to store and pass information into a method. Recall that a constructor is a method, it's just a special method. This down here in the automatically created main method of REPL. This is a parameter named args, which consists of a string array. If we wanted to make our own method other than the constructor in the player class, such as add to score to increase the player's score, and we wanted it to have a return type of an integer to return the score, return score then this method can also have parameters because parameters are always defined in the brackets of a method. So this could take int score to add. And then we could use that parameter inside of the method. So we could have an integer named score to keep track of the score and its initial value will be zero. Then we could take score and give it a value that is equal to its initial value zero plus the score to add. And then when we return score, we'll now have the score be increased using an input. So that means whenever we call this method add to score, Whenever we use it, in other words, we can pass in a value as the parameters, such as 2 if we wanted to add 2 to the score. Let's see why it's being underlined in red here. It's telling us Java cannot make a static reference to the non-static method. That's just because we're using it without making an object. But for our purposes, this is fine for an example. So as you can see, we can pass in 2, and the main method will jump to the method and input 2, and the score will be added by 2. There's some two terms to note about parameters. The variable name that is in the declaration of the entire method, such as this variable name as well, that's known as the formal argument which just means that it is a placeholder for the actual value that we're going to pass in. The two that we have here, that is known as the actual argument in Java, which means we're setting a specific value for the formal argument. Well, great job, everyone. You just defined 
parameters in Java. Stay tuned for the next lecture and we will see you there. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be looking at common constructor errors that will cause bugs in your code. These are common for beginners and we're going to tackle them today to make sure you avoid all of these mistakes. So for this example let's change the name of the class from main which is kind of generic to something more precise such as the regular example we usually use for a bank account. Let's create an instance variable for the bank account. Let's see, what kind of data might a bank account want? Perhaps a year opened. And for this, we're going to use a data type of integer to, con to contain the year. Next, we're going to make a constructor for the bank account class. To do that, we use the keyword public bank account and we have our first constructor and we're going to accept a parameter to match the number of instance variables in the class and there's only one so we will create an argument for it your opened input now here comes where the common mistake is often done the next step of creating our constructor is to set the value of the instance variable to get the input value. And here we have done it properly, but the common mistake you might make as a beginner is to put the data type of the instance variable again when you set the value of the instance variable. This is actually two different things. These two elements are actually unique. If you hover over this year opened variable, nothing will, no error will come up. But if you hover over this one, you'll see that the message, the value of the local variable year opened is not used. And you'll notice it says local variable instead of instance variable. That's because whenever you, whenever you add a data type to an, a variable name, you are declaring the variable. And we already declared it up here. So when you declare it inside a method, you are actually creating a new variable, a local variable that is local to a method. So this is the first mistake to avoid. And to fix this mistake, you delete the data type. So now instead of declaring a brand new variable, you are assigning a, a value to the existing variable. And we can go ahead and test this by creating a set method and a get method to get the instance variable value. So let's go ahead and do just the get method for our purposes. Get year opened. We're going to return the data that we need because remember this is private so we can't test this but we can test a public element in our main method. Let's go ahead and print the line that will contain the value returned by this method, which is the value of our instance variable, to test that the input is being done properly. And to do that, as you can see, we get a red error here. And that's because we haven't made an object yet. We need an object whenever we want to use a method in a class. And to do that, we're going to create an object using the typical syntax that we have used in the past. Bank account equals new bank account object using the constructor. And you can see REPL will even prompt you with the parameters it needs. We can put in something like 2030. And now we can call get your opened from the bank account object. There we go. Now if we hit run, we can look at what will be printed out when we call the objects get your opened method. Okay, right now it's printing only hello world and that's because we're running main.java whereas we changed the name of the class. So in order to do that, we 
can still run main.java because that is the file name, but to run the specific class of bank account, we must change this name from main to bank account instead. Let's go ahead and do that. Copy and paste this line which runs code. And then type bank account and hit enter. Let's try it one more time. It's giving, oh yeah, we're missing the J at the beginning. Copy that improperly. Bank account, hit enter. There we go. Now we are running the bank account class and you can see it will print hello world and then it will print 2030, the value that we input into the object. Let's look at what would happen if we attempted to do the common constructor mistake, which is to put the data type in front of the instance variable name when assigning it the value of the input. If we hit run, let's look at what value we'll get this time. Wait, for, again, we have to, once again, we have to make sure that we copy the path to our bank account class. Let's go ahead and do that. We can also type it out, Java class path, which refers to the location of the class and running a Java unit of the bank account class. Hit enter and look at this. Now we are printing the main methods print methods in the make account class and it's printing hello world and then it's printing the second print line here is printing a zero and that's because this created a new variable instead of assigning the input to the field of the object. So if you are ever getting the default value for an instance variable instead of the input you put in, which we put 2030, it's because of this common constructor mistake. Great job everyone, you just learned about the first common constructor bug you might encounter as a beginner. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next video. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be looking at the second and final common constructor error that beginners can make when creating constructors. So let's go ahead and use a new example for this. Right now we have a class called main but we can go ahead and change that to something more concrete such as a police department. All right, let's go ahead and initialize, or rather first declare a private instance variable for a police department class. What kind of data might a police department store? Well, it might store an address as a string. So we can type string address and there we have our first instance variable. Now we can go ahead and create a constructor to set proper values for this instance variable. So we do that by using the same syntax as in previous tutorials. We open the constructor body and we match the number of instance variables with the number of arguments that the constructor contains. String address input. And then we set the value of the instance variable to the value we're getting as the input. Now, this is the proper way to create a constructor and here is where a common error can occur, where you add a return type to the constructor. Let's look at the error that instantly pops up. This method has a constructor name. This message from REPL is telling us that police department is has a proper syntax and the same name of the class so it is being recognized as a constructor and constructors must never have return types so that's why you must not have any return type such as string or int or double here although you are required to have it for other methods the constructor is a special method which cannot have a return type Let's look at what would happen if we did put a return type and then attempted to make an object of a police department. So we can make an instance variable, or not an instance variable, but a regular variable because it's not inside of a class, it's inside of a main method. 
police department, police department, and then we can initialize the variable by giving it a value of a new police department by using the constructor call. And we have to input an address such as 100 Main Street in double quotation marks because the only accepted data type is a string which we set here. So we are now creating an object using a constructor call. Let's go ahead and run this and see if REPL will allow us to do it. And look, we have hit an error message. Let's take a look at what it will tell us. Well, it's telling us that the constructor police department in class police department cannot be applied to the given types. And that's because we were required to have no arguments, but it found a string. So as you can see, REPL is not recognizing this as a constructor anymore. It's now recognizing this as a different method. And therefore, if you recall from the previous lectures, it will create its own constructor, which looks like this. Because it now no longer accepts that we made one ourselves because we added the return type making this constructor no longer a constructor, but a, reg a regular method instead. And so it created this one on its own, behind the scenes without showing us, as Java will do each time you do not make your own constructor. And then when we tried to create an object with a parameter, we got the error that that parameter did not match the parameter requirements of the default constructor, which does not accept any parameters. So the way to fix this error is to remove the return type from the constructor and hit run. Because now we have created the constructor properly with the proper syntax. So great job everyone. Thank you for watching. You just learned about the second constructor error to avoid as a beginner. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for the next tutorial. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be answering the question, what is the assignment statement in Java? So for this example, let's build some variables and look at how we can assign values to them. So suppose we have an integer named x. Just like that, we have a variable. Now, in this case, the variable has been declared, but it is still uninitialized. Currently, it has only its default value assigned to it by Java. We can go ahead and print out the value of that, and we will get the default value. Go ahead and take a guess if you can remember what the default value is of an integer. All right. Instead, REPL is giving us an error variable x might not have been initialized. And to fix that, we can declare it above the main method. That will remove the error for us. Let's go ahead and hit run again. And we also change the word to the keyword in front of the data type to static so that we can use it in static methods. And as you can see, Java will print 0 as the default value of x. Now, right now x is declared, but it is uninitialized. To initialize a variable, we assign it a value. So in order to do this, we take the variable name and we use the assignment operator, which is this equals sign here. And this assignment operator will, will store a value in memory. So if we want to change the value of x from 0 to 100, we do so just like that. And now the value will be stored in memory at the memory address that this variable holds. Because that is the role of the variable, is to store the address in memory where its value is located. And we can only assign a value using an assignment operator. Right here, what we have is 100, and that's an expression. It's the value. We can also assign a variable to have the value of another variable, just like x equals y. 
we can go ahead and hit run on that and we'll get an error because we haven't we have not declared or initialized y yet so the error is cannot find symbol y to fix that we make a second variable named int y and now if we hit run let's look at what we will get well we have added another print line statement, so we will get what we got before, the hello world line, and then the zero, which is the value of x before we set it to 100. So let's go ahead and copy this print line statement and put it underneath x equals 100 to verify that we have put 100 into x. And then to print the value of x again once we have given it the value of y instead. And now we can see in the console we have 0 as the initial value of x, and then it did indeed get the value of 100. But then it got back to 0, and that's because the value of y is 0. Because up here, we declared y, but we never initialized y, and therefore y will have the default value of an integer, which in Java is 0. The element on the left of the assignment operator must always be the variable identifier, which means it would be incorrect to do something like 100 equals x. If we try to write this, immediately we have a red underline in REPL underneath 100, and we'll get this message above it when we hover over the 100. The left-hand side of an assignment must be a variable which is exactly what we just said. This will be the only way you can initialize a variable. You must put the value to the right of the assignment operator and the variable identifier, so the name of the variable, must be to the left of the assignment operator. Let's see what happens if we hit run on this with the error message still giving us an error and you'll see we'll get the error unexpected type 100 equals x and it's pointing to the 100 and it's saying it required a variable but it found a value and that's because the compiler recognizes that when it sees the assignment operator it knows that to the left should be a variable but instead it found a value and that's why it is giving us the compiler error well great job everyone you just defined the assignment operator and this whole well this is wrong this one but up here, this is what is known as an assignment statement, and this is the assignment operator. Great job, everyone. We will see you in the next video. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing more about the assignment operator in Java. So let's go ahead and build a variable to look at this example. And we've been using integers in the past. So let's go ahead and instead make a string this time. We can do a static string color. We make a static so that we can test it in our static main method quite simply. Now, this is known as the assignment operator. We don't have it yet, but we can use it instantly whenever we initialize the value of a variable. So if we want to give color a color such as blue, we go ahead and do so just like that. Now in Java, whenever you use the assignment operator, it is pronounced gets rather than equals. So you would say color gets blue, which means the variable color gets i.e. gets assigned the value blue. We can go ahead and print a go ahead and use system.out.println to print the value of the color variable to verify that we indeed initialized this variable's value correctly. And there we have blue popping up in the console so we know we did it correctly. Now, whenever the compiler jumps into the main method and looks at our code, the expression to the right of the assignment operator will get evaluated first, and then the value will be assigned to be stored inside of the variable. So it works right to left. And 
An important thing to note is that a variable in Java can only be assigned a value that is compatible with its data type. Because in Java we're required whenever we declare a variable, we are required to state the data type up front. This is different from other languages that assume a data type based on the value. In Java you must put the data type first. Which that means that we couldn't do something like try to initialize color to a value that was not a string such as blue without double quotation marks. If we try to run this, we would get an error because blue is no longer a string. Strings are required to have double quotation marks. And as you can see here in the console, we get error cannot find symbol. It's because it, it does not recognize the symbol B in blue. We can fix this by adding double quotation marks around blue and the error will disappear. Let's go ahead and test that by hitting run and there you go, the error is gone. We also could not give color a value of 12 for example because 12 is not a string, 12 is an integer. Let's go ahead and run that and as you can see we get the error int cannot be converted to string. And that's because the compiler will go to the right side of the assignment operator first and it will recognize that 12 is an int and then it will try to place 12 into the color variable but it will not be able to because it won't be able to convert the integer into a string to store in a string variable. So this would also be wrong. However, we could put double quotation marks around 12 and this transforms the integer into a string and the error will disappear because now we are putting in a string value into a string variable and as you can see in the console the error message is gone. Great job everyone, you just learned more about the assignment operator and the proper values that you can put into variables in Java. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this lecture we're going to be looking more at assignment statements and how we can assign variables to have the value of other variables. So let's go ahead and make our first variable. For this example we're going to be looking at a bank account. So let's make a static double with the balance in USD of the bank account. Now Initially, balance in USD will have the default value of 0.0, .0 and we can go ahead and test that by using a system.out.println of balance in USD and hit enter to autocomplete that for you. And you will see in the console it will print the value of balance in USD, which is 0.0. .0. Now suppose we wanted to make another variable called cash to deposit in USD someone's depositing cash into their bank account. In that case we would want to take the value of cash to deposit and put it into balance in USD. So we can go ahead and do that right here by typing the name of the variable that will get the new value and use the assignment operator to give it the value of the other variable. And when we hit run we won't notice a change because we're not printing the value of balance in USD. So you can go ahead and do that right underneath the initialization of balance in USD. And you'll notice it'll print 0, 0.0 twice because we have not given cash to deposit in USD a value itself. So let's go ahead and do that. To make it crystal clear, let's initialize the values of the variables up front by giving balance in USD the value of 0.0, .0 and cash deposit in USD the value of 100. Then we can hit run and we will notice that the value of balance in USD will be printed here and it will now be 100.0 instead of 0, 0.0 because the value on the right will be assigned to the value on the left. We could not do it the opposite way around. For example, if we tried to assign cash deposit in USD to be balance in USD, well, 
this would be assigning the value of balance in USD to cash to deposit in USD. It would be backwards and it would not work. So it's, it would not work for our purposes of assigning the value to the balance. So we're going to put wrong here. Okay, so that is the key takeaway is that the variable receiving the value, if you have two variables, will always be the variable on the left. Great job, everyone. You are now an expert at assignment statements and assigning values in Java. We will see you in the next tutorial. Hello everyone and welcome back to our Java tutorial series. In this tutorial we're going to be answering the question, what is null in Java? Now we briefly saw null earlier when we discussed the default values of reference data types such as string in Java. So let's go ahead and use that to learn about what is null. Whenever we create a string variable its default value will be null. Let's go ahead and print that as proof using the print line method to print the value of address. We can hit run and we will see the value of address in the console. And as you can see here, it is null. Null means no object or no reference. And that means it is only used for object or reference data types. And you'll recall object, in other words, reference data types, begin with an uppercase letter, as opposed to the primitive data types such as integers, they, which begin with a lowercase letter, or the primitive data type of char, which would begin with a lowercase letter as well, the data type, the actual name of the data type itself. Whenever you see a data type with an uppercase letter as the first letter, you can recognize that as an object or reference data type. Whenever you create an object, its default value will be null as well. Because as you'll recall, an object slash reference data type is any object string is one such example. Let's go ahead and look at another example by changing the class to a more solid example such as a pharmacy. And then suppose we wanted to go ahead and make a pharmacy object. We would do so by calling the pharmacy class name, creating a name for the variable pharmacy, pharmacy object. And then we go ahead and assign pharmacy object to the value of a new pharmacy using the constructor. Now we can run this and we will get no errors in the console. And that's because we have assigned the object a value of a new pharmacy object. But let's go ahead and look at what would happen if we did not do an assignment on pharmacy object. Because as you can see, we did not do an assignment on address. We didn't give it a value and therefore its initial value was null. Right here, we are creating a pharmacy object variable and let's go ahead and see what would happen if we printed its value. System.out.println pharmacy object. Let's go ahead and hit run on that and see what it prints for the value of this variable, which we are declaring the data type as a pharmacy, which is referred to as a reference data type. As you can see, we'll get the error that the variable pharmacy object might not have been initialized. And let's go ahead and move this variable up out of the main method and make it static so that we can print its value in a static method. And we'll hit run again and wait for it to spit out the value of these, this variable of a reference data type. All right, 
as you'll see, it won't print you any value and that's because its default value will be null because we haven't assigned it any to any constructor. Now, it's important to note that null is not relevant for primitive data types. It's only relevant for this object, in other words, reference data type. So whenever you're using a class to create an object, the variable that will hold the object will always have a reference data type. You cannot make an object of an integer data type, for example, because this is a primitive. It's not for objects. Objects can only be made with a reference to a class and therefore they will always have the default value null. So the key takeaway is that every object you create without assigning a value will have the default value of null no object, i.e. no reference. Great job everyone, you've now answered the question what is null in Java. Thank you for watching and we will see you in the next tutorial.